Welcome to Midpoint, OCC's midweek podcast aimed at helping you connect with last week's message and prepare you for next week's sermon. Let's dive in. Hello and welcome to Midpoint, your midweek connection to Orchards Community Church. My name is Wesley and I'm the children's pastor here and I have James Green with me here today as well. And, and when people listen to the podcast, I know they put our pictures up, but like by now, they don't need the pictures. They know your voice even before you say you're Wesley, right? I, I, I would think I, so. I think so. I, uh, our, I would... our loyal listenership. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, just in case... Always I mean, good. Yeah. We had the question come from back east somewhere. Yeah, know, so. and they, they might know, yeah. Covering and, your bases. But honestly, do you think they really care that I'm the children's <laughs> pastor? <laughs> Probably not. I think they care more about the quality and timber that's, of your voice. That's like, right. That, that guy sounds good. My name is Wesley, and that is all that you need. Need to know. <laughs> or maybe not need to know, but care to know. <laughs> that's all you care to know. <laughs> I'm sorry for pulling us off the yeah. rails before we. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, um, you continued us in the book of Daniel this week. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, chap- Daniel chapter two, verses thirty-one to forty-nine. Accurate. Um, I've been plowing through your big passages, so mm. it's refreshing to be on a little shorter <laughs> one this week. Uh, we'll blow that up this week. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. Uh, and in a sermon titled "So." That's what it means. It means. <laughs> yeah, I think I feel like the cadence was probably pretty accurate. There. You, were, you were spot on. Man. Yeah, yeah. In the Dare to Be a Daniel series. series. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I actually have a follow up question from last week's podcast, and I just thought, you know, that's a place to start. Yeah. Sure. Why not? Why not just ask questions from the previous podcast? I mean, Make sure people are paying attention. Yeah. Me and Brenton were setting up questions for the next, next week. Yeah. <laughs> this time I'm pulling questions Go from backwards. last week. Yes. Yeah. You and Force discussed um, that a lot of time passes through the book of Daniel. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then also that it was written in different languages, which mm-hmm. that was a really interesting thing. And I think you talked about that also yeah. in your sermon as well. Yeah. Um, but... How many writings is Daniel made up of? And like, do the chapters like align with those breaks? Is there anything identifiable? <laughs> That's a trickier question than you might think, because there's no quick way to answer it. The chapters do, for the most part, align. There's really probably three significant breaks in Daniel, but I'm only going to really do two. Like, we're going to talk about, hey, here's who Daniel is in this age of the Gentiles and the things that are going on. And then the, the last part of the study is going to be, and here's Daniel's character and why we're supposed to aspire to, you know, dare to be a Daniel. The actual breaks occur in the different languages because it starts in Hebrew because legitimately it's Daniel and his buddies being taken captive, you know. And then from the time, the onset of the captivity is when it switches to Aramaic when you're dealing with a, a Gentile audience. And then it goes back. And so those are probably the, the more pronounced breaks, and they're not even chapter breaks, but pretty close. Um, the Aramaic portion in chapter 2 starts like in verse 4 or whatever. So it's always odd to me, and I, I haven't actually researched this a whole bunch, but like, you know, somebody went through and put chapter and verse breaks in, and sometimes they make total sense, and sometimes you're like, why is that a new chapter? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. we're still on the same thing, you know? And so I don't really know, and, I, and I'm not a theologian to be able to, well, everybody who studies and thinks about God as a theologian, but but I'm not, you know, a, a Bible commentator that way. So I don't know why they make the breaks where they do sometimes. Yeah, I wonder if it's kind of like to some degree just like the QWERTY keyboard where it was like, <laughs> you know, it was put together for convenience and then it just stuck. Stuck. Yeah. And then like it just at this point is the re- the referencing is impor- more important than the actual Well yeah, because again you you think of the upheaval you'd have if you tried to now you know put new chapter verse breaks that that would be weird for a lot of people. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm fine with it. And, and again, this is going far afield of where we were. Like, if I'm going to teach, like when I taught through Luke, when I taught through Acts and teaching here through Daniel, there's a significant process that takes a long time where I'm charting out, how do I make these breaks? Because, you know, like, sometimes in Daniel, it works out like this next week, I'm just preaching all of chapter three. That's great. Well, I couldn't have preached all of chapter two. Number one, it's just too long. And number two, there were two distinct parts. Mm-hmm. And, and so when you're looking at that, you're going, okay, how much can we tackle in the time period that we have, and how and are these things aligned? You know, because that's the that's always so weird to me. I don't want to just like you know, okay, stop, and we're going to pick. You know, we can pick it up again the next week, but you want to kind of get things in their context. And so that, honestly, and it's 
fascinating. It's fun to do, but it's a lot of work to go. Okay, you know, and and you know, when you're looking at long books like Luke and Acts, where we taught for a year and a half, it's really hard to, <laughs> to chart all those out and then stay consistent with it. Because sometimes you get to it, like, hey, I charted this out a year ago, and then I got here, and I was like, this is still too much. You know, how do you split that up? So. Those so, are fun questions. So, like, you did um, the uh, was it Second Corinthians? Yeah. Or did you do both of them? Um, I did First Corinthians. I don't think I did Second Corinthians. I've studied Second Corinthians because I planned on doing it, but I don't think I've taught that here yet. Goodness, that's going to look bad yeah, if I have. Been, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't yeah. remember either, so yeah. that makes feeling better. But, but I remember I'm, being in Corinthians. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure we only did First, first Corinthians. Corinthians. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, like, on a book like that, just this is a side topic that I didn't know we were going down, um, <laughs> but but those books were or those letters were mm-hmm. written much more in one setting, and I don't know if Corinthians totally was. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely the points. Like, how would you split a letter up? Yeah. Well, and and that's unique because the things that I remember from Corinthians is that there were probably four letters that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. There's for sure three because he references another letter. And so really the question becomes, yeah, what's the time frame between who's the intended audiences that you get for those? And, And legitimately, and that one is fun for me because of the canonicity question, like, well, the church got three letters from Paul. And two of them made it. Yeah, like two, mm-hmm. two of them in the book. What was that third letter about? <laughs> you know, and and it had to be personal opinion stuff. It had to be stuff that wasn't timeless and applicable today. Yeah, you know. And, but I've never read it. Like yeah. I don't know. You know, stay so. away from carpet color orange. <laughs> <laughs> He's given given some handy advice, but that's just me, you know. And, and seriously, I mean, that, yeah. that's the kind of stuff you're like, is that what he was addressing? And, and of course, you know, in a church like Corinth where they had tons of division, tons of idol worship stuff, I mean, it really could have been all, hey, you know, I'm writing to this particular family, avoid this thing. It could be. I don't know that it was about carpet, but yeah, <laughs> you know, and it could be those yeah. kind of things. Well, some of those things make it into scripture. Some of those things are spo- things we're supposed to apply. So, yeah, th- there's there's neat questions. And again, you you start walking down that trail, yeah. and you can spend a lot of time there. So, yeah, th- but those are fun things to yeah. talk about. Well, I know what you really came here for today, and that was to talk about <laughs> politics. <Yeah. laughs> oh, oh, that we don't video these. That would be. So- Oh, yeah, so I, mean, I thought we'd just start with your stance on political issues. <laughs> As I've said many times before, you can hear that from me if we, if we go out and grab a Diet Coke yeah, or whatever. Yeah. You just won't hear it on the stage. But yes. yeah. yeah, it may or may not be derived from the Holy Spirit in that case. <laughs> but I, I, did, I do have some politics that I think you can get behind. I, I have this one. And I just want to know if this would sway your vote, okay? <laughs> there have been two peanut farmers elected as president. You, would you take a guess of who, any of those? I who, know one of them. Jimmy Carter was a that peanut is, farmer. That is, and Thomas Jefferson, supposedly. I mean, this is from the internet, so I guess. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so can you really trust If that? there was somebody running for office now who was a peanut farmer, and that was would their that platform. sway you? <laughs> <laughs> Like, the guy can't be all bad. He's making peanut butter. He's making peanut butter. <laughs> Sadly, it would carry more weight than it probably is. <laughs> the guy's got no policy, but those peanuts. Those, 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 those peanuts. Will the, will the price of peanut butter go down? Well, that's going to save me a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> really, this is what we do in Midpoint. We just tell on ourselves, yeah, I don't even pay attention to, to platform or anything. I just try and find a guy who likes peanuts. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, let's dive into Daniel. How about that? <laughs> I see now why you didn't give me the politics question at a time. <laughs> That was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was good. I actually had a different direction that I was going about, like, what's the most expensive thing per gram because of, like, the statue. Yes. But, like, I had never heard of any of those things. And I was like, well, that's no, that's no yeah. fun. We can't walk down that road. Yeah. <laughs> Other than uh, prescriptions made it on the list. So, mm-hmm. anyways, in the top ten. That, per that would per make sense. gram, yeah. yes, yeah. Diamonds were very low on the list, actually. So there are oh, things man. that are way more expensive. Look at all the work you were putting in. Yeah, but it didn't. <laughs> it didn't tie in as good as peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, although this was a short passage today, and, and there's a lot to yeah. Daniel. There's mm-hmm. a lot in there. Is there any like? Is there anything you would have liked to explore more? Any rabbit holes you would have loved oh, to have kind of have gone down? Gosh, yeah. Th- th- this is one, and we talk about this every week. I, I end up having way too much to actually fit 
that like there was so much stuff. I presented what I believe is accurate about Daniel's thoughts on who these four world empires were. Most, I mean, I really do believe most conservative scholars, theologians, commentators agree. Hey, these these parts of the statue are representative of Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome. But there were, I mean, I read several different things from folks who said no. You know, they they think maybe the silver and the bronze, the silver was the Medes and the bronze is the Persians, and then the actual iron is Greece, and then Rome is everything after. Because, you know, legitimately Rome did have quite a divided kingdom, and some of that was the imperialistic. But, I mean, in that, I don't, I don't know that we have to know. I think much more, the, the final landing spot there is, it's this picture of the fact that as mankind is trusted to govern ourselves, we're not really getting this done. <laughs> and so with that, does it matter which empires, you know, but so I, I had a lot, I'd taken a lot of notes. I read a lot of stuff. I wanted to present, Hey, here's commentators who disagree with me. And there just wasn't room to stick it in there. And, and I wrote, and I mean, I don't know what happened, but I really started going on the stone thing, you know, because I, I really believe the stone cut out by no human hands is Jesus. It strikes the weak part of the statue. And like, I, I just started, there's tons of references in scripture of Jesus as a stone. And oh, so, I, so I had like, you know, 10 references written down. I was like, here's where he's this, you know, and then like I had time for none of them. <laughs> I was like, oh man. So, but, but it's that idea of, you know, people, I think generally accept that because if we've read the Bible, we, we do understand he's referred to as a stone. So I didn't have to have it, but it was fun research. And then I pulled like 15 pages. I was like, well, not using any of this <laughs> you know, so, happens every week. It just kind of hurt this. How week. many pages? I mean, like, I don't need to know size font, but like how yeah. many pages is a normal sermon for you? Well, and, and yeah, that's a loaded question because of my eyesight, I, I type in a, a larger font. Yeah. <laughs> so people make fun of me for that. I I'm always shooting to try and be around six thousand words in a sermon, and I still handwrite notes. It's just the way I learn. And it's what I do. And so as I'm reading commentaries, as I'm listening to sermons, as I I've pulled out my uh, my Old Testament prophets notes from from seminary and been going through that. And so I just kind of start writing. I just write by hand, and then I try and take all that, and then I write. Hey, here's here's how I'm thinking. Here's how I'm going to process through this, and that's where you know trying to come up with an outline and all those points. And like I typically will write just handwrite like 50 pages of notes, and that's too many <laughs> for me to get into a sermon. And so I know I'm going to end up cutting stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the funny process. And you guys have all been up in my office and seen where I've got papers. Like you know, that's where I'm like, yeah, that, that's not going to make it. You know, that's that was fun for me. Or we'll bring that up in midpoint, but I just can't fit it in 40 minutes. So that. I, I, I keep thinking I'll get better, at that. <laughs> but that's the process every week. You know? and, and but that way, at least I feel like I'm not missing stuff. Like mm -hmm. I, like I'd hate to feel like I had to pad a sermon to get to you know. Like I always have to cut. So yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, and sometimes I mean yeah, and sometimes it's just is distracting from the main point too much, and it's like well, a really cool thing or a really good thing. But I, I learned that in seminary, and it was the thing like if I'm gonna have to cut something, I start going through and I cut jokes and I cut personal stories and I cut because that's the stuff you you need to cut. Like I don't want to cut Bible, mm -hmm. and that's why it really hurt me. Like I, I ended up pulling a Bible verse late on Sunday morning because of the tragedy that happened with the attempted assassination, and I ended up adding a little stuff into the sermon on Sunday morning, and I cut a, a Bible verse, which I already had another Bible verse saying the exact same thing. But I still always feel bad about that. I'm like, I got to cut something, because I just mm -hmm. added two minutes to this, <laughs> this sermon. What, you know? And and again, I, I don't know. I want to I want to say the things the Holy Spirit wants me to say, but we are operating under this paradigm where we have multiple services on Sunday. I can't just go forever because the parking lot will end up being a mess and, and the lobby will, you know. And, and so it, it's just kind of praying and going, okay, God, do you want me to say this? So it, it's a weird process. It, it's a humbling process. Uh, I love it when people say they're praying for me in it because it's not easy. But I'm so blessed because <laughs> it's what I get to do. So yeah. I love the process. It's just work. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I mean, yeah, that's, I mean, look at all the extra knowledge you have. <laughs> I pick up some great Bible trivia. <laughs> <laughs> you're actually pretty good at trivia anyway. Anyway, yeah. You're, you're uh, gifted trivia. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's won me a few contests, but <laughs> yeah. that's about all you get out of it. Yeah, I'm not a good trivia person. And I'm not a quick responder. That's yeah. the... 
the, <laughs> weird, the weird stuff that sticks in my brain. I don't know. Yeah. We went down with Jenkins and Berries to one of the place, Bumper Crop, I think, downtown, and did a trivia night, and, and Christine and I were late. And Barry's and Jenkins were mad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, they like already filled in the first section and like they came back. Did you know this? And I was like, yeah, this is it. And they were like, oh, <laughs> like, you should have waited. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> they couldn't wait. They were on the clock. It was my fault. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's not, that's not my thing. Definitely. Not for, a, for whatever reason, God's wired me. That's yeah. my thing. <laughs> I do remember a long time ago sitting in a vehicle with two other guys that were on staff at the time, mm-hmm. um, and it's relevant. But I remember you guys communicating like Bumblebee from Transformers entirely <laughs> in movie quotes. And you guys were like having a conversation, and I was like, well, I'm just going to sit back here and enjoy <laughs> this constant barrage yeah. of pop culture. Another very, very unusual gift. I don't know that there's any value to it, but yeah. I, I can right. still do that. Yeah. And I don't even watch it hardly any movies anymore. They're all movies from the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, half the trailers, you could just watch those and probably get and, all the Yeah, you get everything stuff. you need. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> we actually did get one question this week, um, and then it starts with, hi there. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Very sweet. Yeah. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on whether the statue could also represent each civilization or ruler's relationship with God. Could it be the, that the value of the statue went down because we strayed further and further from God? Greece and Rome were both um, polytheistic in our current world, has a very divided view on religion as a whole. Yeah. I wonder if our spiritual values could also be attributed to the story of the statue. Thanks. For listening, I look forward to hearing your thoughts. We enjoy hearing from you. you yeah, Thanks, Michaela. We like to hear your thoughts, too. No, that's a neat question. And again, when you talk about things that you, you don't get to flesh out entirely, you know, the, the picture I presented was from the head of the statue down to the very, very weak feet. It is diminishing in value as a picture of the fact that it went from a monarchy to an oligarchy to, you know, literally, you know, the, the imperialistic view. And in that, people get in the way. I mean, this is the problem, you know, and, and we've talked about this a ton in the ministry. If you have a committee or you have a small group or something like that, there's a size that's just right. And then there's a size where there's too many people because then you have too many <laughs> differing views you're trying to work through. And so in that, I, I like the question, the, the, the tenant of the question, because like that's one of the things. As you move down and you're putting more trust in men, you're putting less trust in God. So truly, they are connected, I believe. I think it, it, it does exist in that spiritual realm. And I, I guess you know, we could spend a lot of time talking about that. But really, what we're more focused on is, well, where do we live today in that? And, and so good conversation to have and, and worthwhile, I think, to have. But you know, kind of mistakenly, people say, well, well, America was formed as a Christian nation. America was formed on a lot of Judeo-Christian values. Mm-hmm. But it was specifically not formed as a Christian nation. Because the guys came from England, they saw that, and they did, <laughs> they knew that didn't work. Mm-hmm. And so this was the whole idea of the freedom of religion. And, and so you see things that, that I think sometimes we're just being responsive. Uh, I know there's bills being passed and people talking about you ought to put you know the Ten Commandments back in schools. I think it's a phenomenal idea. But if you're going to go down that path, then you also have to say, okay, and we're also going to read the Quran in schools. And we're going, yeah. Because that's what religious freedom really yeah. establishes. And so, which was better off to say, okay, I don't want to introduce this thing that I know is misguided into the schools. And so instead, I'm going to teach my kids the Ten Commandments. And in my home where I have the responsibility and I'm supposed to, you know, well, those are great things to talk about. They, they really, really are. But all of them are because, yeah, as a nation, not, not just trying to blame America now, as you've seen from the head down from Babylon to where we are now, people are moving further and further and further away from God, not closer to him. So, again, I think it's a great question for Kayla, and, and I think the, the premise is right. There's a component of that, that as we notice that we are not getting better, stronger, faster as people, it is because we're not trusting in the Lord, and we're trusting more in ourselves. And what does Scripture tell us? I mean, that's, that's as clear as it can get. Don't lean in on your own understanding. Trust in God. Well, that's not trivia. That's not a sound bite. Like, that's what we're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. I don't see people doing it. I, yeah. I, there are times I struggle doing it, so... Neat question, and yes, I would say she's on to something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, 
made me think about, you know, my question. I mean, you were kind of led into it a little bit already, but yeah. but what would that statue look like today in America? I, I told you yesterday I thought that was a great question, and I really did think about that. I, I didn't spend a lot of time, uh, sadly, just, you know, in, in the time frame of how we get to do this. You know, you preach on Monday night, and we do staff meetings on Tuesday morning, and here we are. Um, but, man, I thought about that one last night. And, you know, the reality is, I don't know that we'd get our own statue. You know, I mean, I think we're included as part of, yeah. the, you know, the feet of, of clay, as you, the popular reference we get out of that. But, I mean, that iron mixed with clay idea. But I really started thinking about, and again, this is, you know, spoiler alert, you know, when you get to Daniel chapter 7, like, I think we revisit the things you see from Daniel chapter 2, but not from the perspective of King Nebuchadnezzar, who had this dream about the statue in the form of a man. I think that is supposed to, to be the history of mankind. But when we see it in chapter 7, it's really more from God's perspective. And Daniel shares, and, and he doesn't share an image of a statue, if, you, if you've read ahead. or you know, It's like the, the beasts, the four beasts as the world empires. And like they are bizarre looking beasts. <laughs> They're unnatural looking beasts. Is that how God looks at us? Is that, is that what he sees when he looks at the statue of America? And, and gosh, it was super convicting. I'm getting goosebumps <laughs> thinking about it right now because I thought, well, this is what we do. And I was thinking about it in light of the question we got from Michaela. You know, is it because we're moving further and further away from spirituality? And so you look at mm -hmm. politicians and, and, and virtually, I mean, I don't know many, virtually all politicians, either side, whatever platform, you, you know, they, they will be at a event, a rally, a conference, whatever, and they'll say something about God and Jesus, you know, when, whenever in the Bible about whenever they think it'll, it'll actually, you know, get them some votes. But then you look at their lives, if you look behind the curtain and they don't live like they follow Christ whatsoever. Yeah. What does that say? I mean, that, <laughs> that would have to show up in the statue. <laughs> I actually thought about that in our, our devotional that we had this morning. Um, yeah. There was a line where, where in the book we're reading, um, um, he talks about how why don't you see these like fame pastors in yeah. persecuted countries because it's about it, like that reveals the heart behind exactly yeah. um, and I just I thought that was really that actually just made me think about this yeah and, and like I say and that's the picture so uh, again could we have a statue in America well if that was God's desire for somebody to dream and interpret all that but I mean the thing we see from twenty five hundred years before this is we're still part of that statue. Like, I think we are for sure included in, in the feet of, of iron mixed with clay. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, does it truly probably point more to a world empire that the Antichrist tries to... I mean, like, I think that we'll get to that as we get to the end of Daniel. But but in that, like I say, we just have to own the part, hey, where are we on that timeline? That's why I'd love, and that's just selfish of me. I, I'd really love a more precise timeline. Well, this meant this, you know, we're, we're left to guess on some of that. But we're not left to guess on where we are in the state of, of our desire to follow after the Lord here in America. We know that we're in trouble there. And so for those of us who are Christ followers and, and you hear people say, well, that's what we need to do is return to this, return to that. Yes. <laughs> but but I, I don't think we can, based upon the Constitution and the way that we've set up our government, we can't start mandating things like that. Mm -hmm. It truly has to be a desire for each person to be the church. That, to me, is the biggest question. You asked another great question at the end that we'll get to, but but this idea of are, are there things we're not supposed to emulate out of Daniel? But, I mean, the reality is, as, as we're looking how to be a Daniel, it may literally be, how do I stand up and point to Christ in these really, really difficult situations? Am I doing that? I can sit and lament, well, we don't do this or we don't do that or, you know. And, and man, we could start a conversation that would, there's no way it wouldn't veer into political realms things, abortion, and you know, all these kind of things. And you're like, well, how could you support this person? How could you support that? Well, what are we doing in our own lives? Or yeah, <laughs> are we investing yeah. efforts, energy, prayer? You know, I mean, that's the kind of thing. Like, I, We can't expect somebody else to lead our family, to, to impact others for Christ that we're supposed to impact. Like, We're supposed to do that. Are we equipped to do that well? These are tough questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so, so that's the thing. But, but I do love, and at least I think in studying through Daniel... Man, that should be one of the big takeaways because there is all this symbolism and there are, there are these things where we have to go, okay, where am I? Where, where do I see myself as a person? Where do I see us as a nation in this picture? And that should be challenging. I mean, that's supposed to be convicting. Nobody challenges better than the Holy Spirit, and I think that's the Holy Spirit working through that passage. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and I mean, I think you hit it spot on the... the being able to die to ourselves in, in these times is the, the, the clear takeaway. 
but that's really hard. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I shared this with you. I mean, like I, I never, I shouldn't say never. I don't worry when I'm going to stand in front of hundreds of people and preach God's word. And I'm confident, no, this is what God's word says. I mean, it may be hard. A lot of times it's very, very hard to hear. But like if I say, you know, one of the many things, you know, that we talk about, you know, submit to the government, die to yourself, do these things that, that are clearly out of scripture. Like if somebody's going to get really mad, they're not mad at me. They're, they're mad at God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm just preaching the truth out of the Bible. You know, this is the old don't shoot the messenger thing. There are other things where you're like, okay, I want to say this and, I, and I'm confident this is where, you know, God is leading me on this, but this is hard to take. And this week was was one of those weeks because basically I'm saying, I think this is my interpretation of the statue and it gets to the end where I'm saying, if it's a picture of mankind and how we're doing by diluting, you know, because God wants to be the sovereign ruler overall and we're blowing this up because we're fallen people. Like I, the line that I, I wrote in the sermon and I was like, I don't know how this is going to go. <laughs> it was the one where I said, be honest with yourself and just look at the history of mankind and ask, do you think we're getting better or do you think we're getting worse? And like nine o'clock was the first time and I ended up preaching it three times and the same thing happened every time. But at nine o'clock, I threw it out there and I was like, let's see what happens. You know? and so, <laughs> so I just asked the question, do you think we're getting better? Do you think we're getting worse? And I mean, I'm not saying I saw every face, but uh, almost like a, everyone. Yeah, it was like a tennis match. You could see people nodding. They're like, "No, we ain't <laughs> yeah, getting better." Yeah, you yeah. know, <laughs> I was like, "Well, okay, that landed." Then the way that I, I thought mm-hmm. it was supposed to. I, there is a part where you have to challenge people, and and God's put me in that spot to be able to do it. I'd much rather, 100 percent rather, challenge them from this is the clear truth out of God's word. But sometimes we do have to tell on ourselves. I don't want it to just be me. I, like I, a lot of times, I try to write into the sermon, "Hey, I don't want to put this on you. Let me just tell you, I, I stink at this," because I think that gives people the opportunity to go, "Oh, well, gosh, if Pastor James admits he stinks at this. I guess it's okay for me to say I do too." And I'm trying to soften the blow a little bit. Sometimes you you can't soften the blow. <laughs> I mean, like sometimes you really just have to say, "Have you considered this? We're not doing this well. <laughs> what part do I own in that?" <laughs> so tough passage. I'll just yeah, say that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, I, I mean, when I prepare for these, I mean, again, you know, this is what you get for the prepared me. <laughs> Brace yourself for the not prepared me. <laughs> but there is a line you said that this that stood out to me every single time I heard it, so I'm going to bring it up. And I thought it was a nice little nugget, but I, but I would like some explanation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you said, and I pretty closely, I think you said, he is coming with the church for his church. For his church, yeah. And, and yeah, boy, you talk about things you wish you could unpack more. But but you're right. Christ followers, I think, for the most part, understand that. And it's the difference between the rapture and the second coming. And and those are terms, you know, I hope you're kind of familiar with them. And if not, call and schedule time with Wesley. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, but the idea of, of of those things having to be separate events. There, there are places where you study scripture, and it's hard to tell that those are separate events, honestly. But... If you believe, as I do, uh, in a pre-tribulational rapture, that Jesus is going to come back and and remove his church from what is to come in the tribulation because of his great love for the church, well, then we're not going to have to deal with a lot of the crud of the tribulation. So he comes for his church at that time. He doesn't come all the way down to the earth. He comes in the clouds, and and people rise to meet him, and he takes his church. And then there's going to be this period, and Daniel's going to let us you know walk through this, of of tribulation, and then of great tribulation, where it's going to be pretty rough to be here on planet earth. And then after that, he's coming back. And that truly is the second coming. That's what will come all the way down. But he'll come with who? His church, the people he took in the rapture. So I, I didn't, like, I didn't mean for it to sound like a soundbite, but it does. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, and, but, but there's a reality to it. Like, that's exactly mm-hmm. what's going to happen. And, and those things being separate events, I think scripture does teach pretty clearly. Do I wish it was more clear? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, there's a there's a spot literally if you're ever studying through Revelation and you read through the first three chapters of Revelation and then for the next seventeen chapters the church is gone like there's no <laughs> there's no mention of it it's just not there so I wish at the end of chapter three it said and now the rapture happens because <laughs> that'd be really nice it doesn't and I don't like to make arguments out of silence but then when you correlate yeah. everything else in Scripture that that pretty much is hey that's the time when the church is gone from the earth. They're coming back with Jesus, but they're gone at that time. And and again, there, there's so much to explore on that, you know, because um, I don't know how much people talk about this, but there's a, a term, a concept in theology of, of Christ's imminent return. 
Jesus could come back at any moment. Well, when people talk about that, they have to be clear. Are you talking about the rapture or the second coming? Because if you study scripture, Jesus truly couldn't come back any moment for the second coming because there are things that you see that have to take place. And, and Matthew calls them signs at the end of the age. We see some things in Revelation. And, and so, yeah, the second coming isn't going to happen today because unless God would do a miracle and snap his fingers and those things all of a sudden happened. But the rapture could happen at any time. And that is imminent. I mean, that's what that means, you know. And so Jesus could come right now for his, his church. I think that'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that'd be great. Mariners still haven't won the World Series. Browns still haven't won the Super Bowl. There's some things I'd this like to see. This podcast hasn't been this posted. <laughs> Nobody's going to know what we said here. It's, you know, it's what it is. But 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 that's the thing. And it's like I say, I, I appreciate that you caught that line. And I, I promise. I mean, I didn't mean to make it sound like a, a you know a soundbite. But but it, when you say it, I'm like, oh yeah, that's. A, <laughs> I, I was trying to to explain something that we needed a little more time to actually explain what it was. So yeah, thank you for asking the question. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, and I understood. In, in, yeah, in the and, moment. and again, a lot of Christ followers will understand that. But we do have to. We just need to be cognizant of the fact not everybody who shows up, certainly not everybody who listens online, is going to be a Christ follower. And and so that's a that's a statement that could could benefit from some unpacking. I'll yeah. Say that. yeah. Well, and, and honestly, I mean, some of those statements too. I, I don't think that particular one. I don't know that anybody else would. Yeah. Like yeah. like leave the service really wondering what's scratching you by their that. head. Yeah. But for those that need to understand where you, yeah. you view that or, or stand on that, I mean, it yeah. brought some clarity. For and sure. like I say, being able to walk through Daniel the way we're doing, you know, kind of the revelation of the Old Testament. Will we'll, you know people will learn. Where I land in that, and and I mean, I think I already said, you know, I'm, I'm a pre-tribulational rapture guy. It's the it's the biblical stance that makes the most sense to me, and I, and I think the one that I can defend from Scripture the best. There are theologians that I read and trust as much as I mean, I don't know them, but I but I like them who don't agree. Uh, some of them believe, you know, in in a mid-tribulational rapture. Some of them believe in a post, and that one's really hard to take. Um, but like, they can defend. Here's why, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't think it's a good defense in a lot of those. But these these guys have written a lot of books and they pastor huge churches, <laughs> and so you know, I'm like I'm willing to listen. Let's have the dialogue and see. I think there are things that that really point to the pre trib rapture that that make sense from scripture, and so we'll try and visit some of those, some of the stuff you see in, in Thessalonians, and some of the stuff you see in Revelation. So we'll get there. But like I say, I I also just I mean, if you got to be honest. I don't want to be here <laughs> for yeah, the tribulation. Yeah. It's gonna. It's called tribulation for a reason. I don't want to be here, and so that's really, really helpful for me to go. My understanding of scripture is I won't be. So, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, <laughs> you're gonna go into Revelation next, right? Is that what? <laughs> what ways should we not <laughs> <laughs> moving on? <laughs> <laughs> what ways should we not compare ourselves to Daniel? I mean, was yeah. God using him and the other prophets different than we see today, or or there can there be Daniels of our day? Yeah. I, I thought that was a great question too, Wesley. And you you always come up with with really thoughtful questions on that. Um, in, in title in at least the first part of the this series, you know, dare to be a Daniel. That that is you know, like I don't want to I don't want to put that in a weird spot. I think we have that tendency, and some of it is in our fallenness, where we go, well, I'm never going to be Daniel. You know, I'm not mm-hmm. going to be an Old Testament prophet. I'm not going to have the opportunity to, to you know, uh, walk through the lines, Daniel. And so we start to, whether we mean to or not, we start to kind of denigrate ourselves, and, and, mm-hmm. and we lessen the impact. And For sure. And I just don't believe that's God's desire whatsoever. I think it is, hey, on your journey, on your, your path of sanctification where you become more Christ-like, what are the things that you are supposed to do? Thinking about gifts God's given you, thinking about all those things. There, I thought there was a neat book several years ago now, um, big pastor David Platt wrote called Radical. And, and when it first came out, it kind of swept the church. Um, and Platt caught quite a bit of feedback on it for something that I don't think he intended whatsoever. But it was like you read the book about living these radically changed lives, and like it made you think, I stink at this. Like I'm not. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I'm not a very good Christ follower. And like I remember, and I can't remember what the format was because it wasn't podcast. I don't even know they had podcasts back in the day, but there was some, they, they had a bunch of uh, prominent pastors getting together talking about it or like that. And, and this pastor said, well, I had a guy, you know, who was in my church 
and who taught Sunday school for like 30 years and was just the greatest guy or whatever. And he read your book, and at the end he felt like crud because he hadn't moved to Africa. And you know, <laughs> and Platt was like, that's not what I meant. <laughs> you know. But having to come back and clarify what you meant, some people took it that way. And, and so I do think that that's always that comparison is the thief of joy kind of thing. I'm not going to be Daniel. Mm-hmm. God didn't make me Daniel. He didn't put me in that spot. Yeah. What will I do with the opportunities he's given me? And, and this again, I mean, I'm not trying to, to be circular in, in my argument here. I hate to even call it an argument in the, in the defense of this. But that's the kind of the deal we get. Well, we live in this age now where we have moved far away from the Lord. We don't want him, you know. But then all of a sudden when things don't go well, we do want him to come in. But we don't want to do it by our example or be in the church. We want to mandate things. Well, let's just make it everybody has to do that. Well, how is that any different from Nebuchadnezzar saying everybody has to bow down mm-hmm. <laughs> to the, what we're going to study here in Daniel chapter 3? You know, it's, it's that kind of picture instead of God didn't make us robots. He gave us this free will to choose to follow hard after him, to choose to die to ourselves, to choose to be obedient. And we stink at that. Mm-hmm. So, so let's start there. Yeah. Instead of, well, I can't be Daniel, great, don't be Daniel, be Wesley. <laughs> do the, exactly the things God has called you to do. And when you mess up, go ahead and do that. Well, I'll do better next time. And, and now we're all on our own journey of sanctification. So, so I, I thought that was a great question. And again, I, I don't, still don't mind the title, you know, the dare to be a Daniel. No, I, yeah, I was yeah. not knocking No, yeah. Mm-hmm. But, but, but each one of us has to figure out what does that look like for me? How am I going to be uh, able to stand up in difficult circumstances like Daniel was? And one of the things, and I remember studying this in seminary because it was so funny, a little spoiler alert for what's coming ahead in, in chapter three, is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in this spot where they're not going to bow down and worship this idol of, of King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel's not even in the chapter. Like, he's not there. And, and you're like, God had to have done that sovereignly. I don't know if Daniel was out on official business or, or whatever the deal was, but you know Daniel wouldn't have bowed. But now it's not just Daniel. It's these other guys who get the opportunity to say, see, it's not just mm-hmm. Daniel. Everybody has the opportunity to say, am I going to stand, take a, a bold stand for the Lord, or am I just going to follow the crowd? And so I love that those guys become the guys. And, and honestly, you talk about the timeline, probably 15, 20 years had passed from what we get done there in chapter two before we get to this fiery furnace in chapter three. So these guys had 15 years of saying, nope. We're going to do it God's way. <laughs> and so this they didn't make this decision on the spur of the moment, and this didn't happen the week after. We, we, you know, This happened over a lifetime of them going, no, I'm sold out to the Lord. This is what I'm going to do. And they get the opportunity to do it. And, and I do, because I, I say that all the time, but there, there's a, a line out of Daniel chapter 3 that we should all, yeah, I, I say commit to memory. I mean, I'll paraphrase it, but, but it's just the idea of, hey, you got to bow down and worship this false god. And you remember what they said? It was like, no, <laughs> not going to do that. And even if you throw us in the fiery furnace, like even if you even if you kill us, yeah. And you remember what they said? It was like our God could save us, but even if He doesn't, I'm still not bound down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I get goosebumps every time I think about it because I think, gosh, we just struggle with that so much. We're like, well, God will save me, and then God doesn't save us, and we're like, what happened, God? <laughs> I'm going to trust you or sovereign no matter what happens. I, I'm going to realize you are smarter than me on this. Boy, that's hard to say. But that's exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego mm-hmm. do. That's the example for us. Hmm. Give away the sermon for next week. So yeah. <laughs> still come. There's more fun stuff. Yes, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a perfect transition to talking about next week. Yeah. Yeah. So in case you're wondering, James is talking about Daniel chapter, <laughs> Daniel three, chapter 3, 1 through 30. <laughs> yeah. Big, long passage. Yes, yeah. And uh, in, in their scene in their famous stand. Yes. Um, and walk. They walk around. <laughs> Um, they wander a little bit. There's some wild stuff going on there here. We, we have only scratched the surface. There is, yes, yeah. Um, this one is actually prime for a WB show, um, but we'll let you have it. Well, you're right. This would be. You guys <laughs> talk about Veggie Tales and Rack Shack and Benny, and you get, some, <laughs> you get the whole thing in there. That'd be awesome. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe at another another time. <laughs> but yeah, we can look look forward to that. Um, and yeah, we're. We're praying for you, James, and and, uh, yeah, praying for you guys out there as well. That is all the time we have for this week. We hope you've enjoyed this week's Midpoint. If you'd like to send questions in or have any thoughts, you can submit them on a connection card if you're here in person um, or through the OCC podcast at lewistonocc.org email. You can text that as well. Um, Be sure to join us live online or in service Sundays at 9 
and 10.30 a.m. with the same service again on Monday nights as well. We don't stream that one, but you can join in But you can still show up, yeah. Yeah, and you'll have two other ones you can watch (laughs) until we combine it into one. And then you'll have (laughs) one to watch, which is the same thing. (laughs) Well, it just broke down the whole process. Yes, I did. (laughs) And I don't know why you need to know that. It's just like my job title. (laughs) Irrelevant. More information. (laughs) We hope to see you all very soon. We are glad you are staying connected throughout the week. You are so loved by James and I and everyone here at OCC. Amen. Love you guys.